Landry um, with some different titles than you see on the screen here. I've got a bunch at H2O. So I've been at H2O for uh, about seven and a half years um, doing a variety of roles. So I'm um, speaking to you as kind of a co-product owner really of Document AI, lead a data science team behind Document AI. That's what I've been doing arguably for the last four years. We've had this product, it's pretty new to us, relatively new. Um, we've been, we've had it and been selling it for about a year, but it's based on work that uh, my team and I had done um, for about three years prior to that. So taking a lot of the learnings, productizing that, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And yes, Kaggle Grandmaster as well, and several others on this team. So we've got a lot of modern AI, a lot of um, Kaggle robust knowledge going into this tool. So the first thing is, what, what is Document AI? So, um, you know, our goal with this product, so it's, it's a new space. You've got a lot of different companies doing it. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about how we're different and, and what we do here. So uh, the main goal is extracting information from documents. Really simple, kind of boring. When we first got this about four years ago, it was surprising that that's a thing. Um, but what it really is, is we're going after key information that businesses need. And when you start kind of hearing what this is, you find that businesses have lots of these processes um, going on. A lot of them are done manually. We've got a stack of documents. We're gonna scan those. We have someone keying them in. Sounds old fashioned, but there's a lot of those use cases out there. And um, so I'll talk about a few of those use cases and that might jog your memory of things that you might know where these processes exist. Um, for us specifically, uh, as, as you might guess at this conference, you know we're using AI to do it. Um, modern AI, everything in this tool is recent all the way up to you know, this year, we're creating our own. Um, these models didn't really exist uh, even three years ago to, to do the specific way we're doing right here. So there's two basic components that go into reading these documents. So we've, we've got computer vision and we've got natural language processing. So the computer vision comes in, you may be familiar with OCR. And so intelligent characteristic recognition we're looking at can mean a few different things. Um, we have lots of different OCR libraries and we're trying to use the right thing for the right job. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of companies have PDF um, where you can pretty much copy and paste the text. You don't need to use computer vision in that case and you're gonna have perfect accuracy if you can just extract that information correctly. But you'd be surprised at how many PDFs have really crazy kind of formats in there. It's still not straightforward. There's still ways to make mistakes. So we take that in-house and then use a variety of OCR libraries and we'll let you choose. And I'll show that kind of at the end of some of those, but that's been a big focus of, uh, of ours this year um, is to keep adding more and more OCR libraries that you can use, different techniques, different languages, things like that. Um, and for those of you that have seen Hydrogen Torch uh, somewhere around here, um, we're using that in-house to actually further drive OCR models. So we're using Hydrogen Torch ourselves to build some of the component models of, um, of our OCR pipeline, which right now consists of three different models back to back to back to get that task done. And then you move over to the natural language processing side. So when we've used, you know, the, the character recognition is to see the text on those documents, and then we're gonna work with those in a natural language processing way. With one exception, documents don't always work in reading order. They don't work left to right like reading the Gutenberg Bible and Wikipedia and a lot of the, a lot of the text that, um, that we're training on with natural language processing models, um, documents can be slightly different. And uh, so the way humans lay out documents winds up being concise. We don't wanna write a whole paragraph to say the due date is this. Um, you know, maybe that is pretty simple, but we're gonna, we're gonna go really, really small. Sometimes we'll have things on top of each other. Sometimes we'll put clusters of information and on the left side, we've got tables, which is a really big part of Document AI, really. Um, so the models we use are custom for documents, and that's why I say they're kind of new. So um, we've been processing these as text. Some of you may have tried some of the existing libraries out there and kind of struggled to work with it because it's kind of hard to work with the text as just a bundle of text here. The location's really important. The context is really important. And so we use models that understand that. Um, and like the computer vision side, this is where we'll be expanding as well. We use kind of one workhorse model. For those of you familiar, Layout LM is doing a lot of work here. Um, but this is an innovative space. There's a lot of research papers. There's one that came out in the summer that we're really looking at that give us different angles at this. And again, give more options to try. Almost like Rohan just said with H203, that you don't know which one is gonna be the best each time. Um, so we're giving more options um, in our offering so that you can use the best one for your problem. Certain ones may focus on difficult, dirty documents, and our OCR has gotten much better in the last year um, at handling that kind of stuff. We still have room to grow, 
Um, so we're always working on that, trying to get it better and better um, at difficult documents, uh, just different things, wide documents, big documents, contracts, lots of different things out there. Now our focus specifically is a little different from if you might have seen some other vendors out there. Some of the clouds are looking for general purpose document AI. You put a document in, it's never seen that document or understands it. It's just going to tell you what's on there. And there's use for that. A lot of people use table methods. So they'll try to parse a generic table method, try to segment it in different parts, keys and values, things like that. Ours is a little different from that in that we're going to look at a collection of documents that all support a specific use case. So custom for each use case's needs. What that means is I've got an example of an electricity bill that we'll take a look, a harder look at a little later. Um, I've got a bunch of different electricity bills from different providers in Australia in there. And each one's slightly different in how they lay out the information. It's all the same kind of information. Humans are good at that. You figure out where the due date is, the customer, the address, they're all there, sometimes multiple times, sometimes on multiple pages. But for us, it's important that they're different because a lot of our customers don't control the input source. They're gonna get it from all over the place and they're not just gonna process this one origin, it looks like, um, you know, electricity bill, they need to process whatever comes through. So our models are gonna use the NLP, they're, gonna, they're, they're going to understand the nature of a due date, and they're gonna understand the nature of a billing period, begin and end, even if there's no text whatsoever, as I think this one does up in the top middle right over there, it's a little small, I'm sure, on the screen. But um, there's no text telling you that that's the begin and the end date, none at all. But once you get the hang of these documents, you realize that's what that is. And so that's what we're gonna teach our model. And we wanna show it as much variety as possible. But the things that you're gonna extract from that document, you can notice in here, I've got a few bounding boxes over there. I have picked a pretty trivial one. About, there's about five different things I'm pulling off of this one, pretty basic stuff, but that's pretty typical. When you have to show a second form of ID, you need to open up a home loan. This is one of the documents you need to bring with you or one of the acceptable types of documents. And it's, we don't need to understand the entire bill but maybe a different customer does. And we've seen this with something like invoices. Um, the first use case we had with invoices, only about four pieces of information were relevant out of there. They just needed the total, they needed a couple different things. But as we progress with our supply chain offering, different customers want different things out of there, all the way to fine grained details of there. So now we're extracting about everything we know about the invoices and our understanding of that keeps improving at H2O. But these models are custom to whatever our customers bring. And I'll show you a sample of use cases, and they're all over the board. Different types of contracts, uh, supply chain documents, um, statements like you see here. A statement is a statement to a certain extent, but they are different. Um, so all different things we can do. And that's, again, so our focus is on allowing customers to fit models that they need without being burdened by templates. So the second one is models that generalize to new documents rather than memorizing keywords and location of those templates. And, and so that's how a lot of these tools will work. And our first customer brought with us, they had been doing templates for two years. They had clicked on the specific regions of a hundred different template types, but it just kept coming. And it was more and more diverse. This is a physician referral form. And so they estimated that 60% of what came through after two years of trying to create a hundred different templates, they still only had 60% of the volume covered. And the other 40%, they had no idea, nothing at all, because it didn't recognize it. And so ours, the generalized understanding, was able to do equally as well on new documents as it was the data it was trained on. And your mileage may vary on that, and you start small, but they started with all of that power of two years, so they were able to really quickly get similar accuracy on documents that had never been shown. That template, that, sci, that, that, that specific format had never been seen by the model, but that's the key part here. We're developing a generalized understanding using all the context. And for those familiar, we're basically using a BERT model extended to work with these documents with the locations. So it's a multimodal model. It takes the text um, and the coordinates of, the, of the, um, where each of those boxes are or the content of the OCR. And that's the model that we're gonna use to drive these. Um, and again, as I said, there's a couple different models. This is really changing quickly. So we're gonna stay on top of that and always be using the best model for it. Um, but that's how this works. It extrapolates, it generalizes. That's the, the idea is that we're gonna cover new documents we've never seen. The product itself that I'll flip to in just a sec is going, you know, that we've built is a data science library underneath it that does these things in, in the focus item, but um, a UI that is really intended to be easy to use. Um, yeah, our, our model training is very simple. There's not many parameters to choose. The OCR, it's a, some quick drop downs. We just really wanna get it down to the basics of bring your documents, 
teach the model. So we do have to create annotations, and that's a big part of what we're doing here. A lot of people don't have targets for these. They don't know. They haven't been tracking it. Some that had templates, like that first vendor, they were able to bring everything they had in because they had been doing it in templates. Uh, that's the last one we've seen like that. Everyone else is kind of starting from scratch. So a lot of this tool is trying to help you go quickly through that task of teaching the model what the labels are. I'll talk about that a little bit more too. So, and, but the goal there is that we're creating custom models. So we're gathering the training data, allowing you to annotate it so that we can create those models. And then the big part at the end is deploying pipelines for the end user consumption. So we have a REST API that wraps up a pipeline. And that's a key word here because it's not just models. You heard I said three OCR models. Uh, customers often have one or two classification models. Sometimes they're classifying what a page is first and then going after the contents of that page. And the same models are going to look at all the text on there. They're going to see in big chunks, hundreds of tokens at a time to classify what that document is. And the same for the classification of all the tokens. But the end user consumption Typically for these use cases, again, almost it's a little, you know, these are line of business teams very frequently. People that are already doing these jobs that get an email queue, download the attachment, check it against a second source and agree whether it's correct or send it on its way to a different pipeline. So in those kind of things, our REST API can do the same thing. They can automatically extract the document, send us a document, send the document to us, to our REST API, post one, let the machine learning models work, the entire pipeline. And at the end of the day, they're going to pull out all the specific pieces of information that they wanted. And the, the customer with, that, the, with purchase order confirmations, that is exactly that. There's a person sitting there downloading attachments, checking against another system. They're looking at about 30 different items um, from those invoices. And with invoices, you have multiple different line items. It could be a 10-page, um, sorry, purchase order. Um, the purchase order may have 10 pages worth of items, and we would need to extract them all. And in their use case, they're checking that every single thing on there checks what they believe that was supposed to be on that order. And if everything checks out, they'll remove it from the queue. If not, they send it to somebody to work. Really simple, and we can take out a lot of manual effort anytime that those match. So I'm gonna, the next one I'm gonna show is some of these use cases, and I've broken them down to a little bit of what I just hinted at. So I would call that where they're ingesting a document and checking it as an alternative source as the validation type. We're able to validate A and B, and there's two different systems. And that might sound rare, um, but it really isn't. We actually have the majority of our use cases there. It's a really easy way to deploy AI, because one of the key things we do have to talk about is you know, these are models. Models make mistakes. Humans make mistakes, but these models are going to make mistakes as well. You can make the mistake in the OCR portion, the classification portion. So to be sure that we're robust to those. And that's sort of working with the clients. We have some confidence scores that are coming through. People look at that. There's additional validations um, that people can use um, to try and increase their confidence so that you minimize the human effort. Does a human need to look at it at all? And in the robotic process automation world, this is usually called straight through processing, STP for short. Um, you know, and it's a really tricky thing. If you're validating against something, it's much easier. And so those use cases are really easy to stand up and usually the people working those, you know, when we have an incumbent process, you know, sometimes it's something someone's never been able to try. More often, it's something someone's tried. They just want additional efficiency. Um, those people are really happy <laughs> to get these models in there, helping them get through the easy stuff. You know, sometimes it's a lot of documents. You know, some of these are easy tasks. Some of them are pretty hard. Um, but a lot of the easy ones are still, it's a good place for these models because it's so boring to check and translate and do whatever people are doing um, today. We have all different kinds of use cases with a lot of kind of like menial tasks. This is a great way to use complex algorithms, which is why some people have been doing this for a while, but a lot of these documents are just a little too hard. The OCR is difficult. Uh, the AI, when everything changes, you know, trying to write business rules to, to cover a hundred, a thousand different formats. Um, you know, it's just intractable. So getting these models to generalize is kind of new stuff and it's really powerful. Um, different industries in here, you see a lot of supply chain, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, so similar kind of content passed through the pipeline, starting with a contract, purchase orders, uh, invoices, uh, shipping receipts, things like that. So now I'm gonna show you a little bit of what it looks like. I had a hint of it, oh, make sure this comes right. All right, so this is the front end of our tool. 
Um, I'm skipping all the way to the back, so I'll, I'll back this up a little bit, but just showing you really where we land at the end. So at the end here, I've got my document in the middle, and I've got a, a queue of documents. You can see a little bit on the left, left side, and it's small up there. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Um, and now make the document. And so what we're doing, we've got documents. I'm going to move to the right. So we're, we're going through this queue of documents. And the documents are changing a little bit. You know, we have a lot of the common ones in here. It's not all that diverse. But in a real use case, they typically are. You're going to see the common ones. You know, 80-20 rule often is, is, is true of some of these. So we have, but we're, we're kind of finding the same content. And to be honest, it is laid out pretty similarly in each of these different vendors. But here what we're doing is I'm simulating a pipeline that's been run. And we're producing what the answer is. So we've got here a few of the different things we're looking for. Customer name, it's not quite laid out left to right, but, and we've got the text directly. So we've asked the model to classify each of those tokens. At the end of the day, we want to put those together to kind of human readable, you know, the customer name is Mr. Amit Kumar. The label confidence, the model's pretty confident about this one, 99.4%. The OCR is also confident um, about this one, very clean document. Um, not all the documents are clean, uh, for sure. So I might show one of those if we have time at the end. Um, but we can roll through these and we can see really what we're trying to get at. The address, here it is. And this is editable. So this is something we're working on too, is giving the final state so that we can actually, if there was a mistake, I don't believe there are any of these, I can just override it this way. I can change customer address to be something that's different. Sorry. And it's the same kind of interface uh, applies here. So you see all of the different types of things that we're bringing back. And this is customizable as well. These are the common things we're usually getting from people. But for example, if I had a table, we also want to see the lines that they're tied together, that this quantity goes with this amount, goes with this uh, tax amount and item ID and so forth. So I have a little bit extra that groups things together so people can see it more naturally. But you can see what this also is is a labeling tool. I don't need it for this use case if I'm checking out at the end. But what we have here is a powerful interface that allows people to annotate in the first place. And so let me show you what that would look like. So these are gonna be, I think it's this one that has different documents, I'm sorry. And so when we start with documents, um, we can customize our classes, which you've already seen what they are, but here I can add another one if I want to. And all of a sudden, zoom it in so you can see it. If I want to start going after more information, I can go after my new class here. So this is, a, this is an interactive labeler annotator, easy to use, but this is really key. And we're, we're looking at documents all the time. Documents are very visual. And so it's just a natural thing for us to make this sort of front and center. I haven't shown you too much of the UI at this point, but um, you know, this is how we're gonna record and teach the model what we need. So it's a lot of thinking about what do we want from this. Usually customers know from the start what they wanna try. We might have to iterate a couple times um, on, on some of the classes and they might notice there's a couple different things they wanna split out. So there's a little bit of um, iteration here. But most of the time, we're going to set up our classes and start teaching the model what it is. And these are going to be similar documents that you've seen before, uh, maybe a few different vendors. But um, it's a little slow here. There we go. But um, so I'm going after these. And you can see the other part of the labeler. I know it's going to be really small in here. Oops. Let me zoom in a lot. We can actually shift what we show here as well. So we can. Remove the boxes, add the boxes, remove the labels, add the labels, change them, Oops. change what we're seeing here. So uh, right now we don't have text on the screen, but we could um, change the colors. So a lot of things to help people recognize, quickly go after um, and annotate these. And it's pretty easy when you, when you get the hang of it um, to, to annotate the data. And that's because that's kind of one of the burdens of getting these started. And so, but the powerful thing here is that while we annotate with the same tool, like I showed you before, we can keep using that same tool to add new annotations after we have a model that's done a decent job. So a common way of iterating a data set is to get maybe 100 documents labeled or 50 or something like that, depending on how easy. This one's pretty easy. It's already at a pretty high accuracy with just 20 or something like that documents in there. Create a model and then use that model to predict against new data. So if I were to upload a second data set of another 100 documents, I can immediately score it, get the model's opinion, and it's 
in certain cases, in many cases, it's faster to change what the model did, you know, use the model for everything it's good at already, and just tweak it. And we can use the same interface. So it's really familiar to just keep using the same thing to keep adjusting boxes. So if this was a prediction of an address, which is fine, but if I thought it was the date, it's really easy to just change those and spot check it. So we put a lot of thought into trying to make this as easy as possible because I can run models iteratively, keep training models, and score against new data and use this same interface. I'm just going to show you one more thing on what's this, the one that has accuracy. Here we go. So I've been talking about the models uh, a little bit, um, but to show, you know, here's kind of how we look at things as well. So this is a model I ran against, I think, 18 of those, um, those electricity bills and gas bills, the utility bills, I guess we'd say. Um, so we're performing classification. We're doing it on every single token. And so our support over here is how many tokens were in each class. So we've got macro about our whole data set up top. And then here we have each of the classes. And this is usually where we spend our time when we iterate with customers or ourselves trying to stand some of these up early on um, both ways. So it's already pretty accurate. We can see the F1 score here, our precision and recall, pretty transparent about what it is. And you see, you know, this imbalance 17 versus 73 is not much of a deal, but um, you know, sometimes we're fighting things where the customer has only five examples of a certain class they were interested in. And so, um, you know, the models are very robust to that class imbalance. Um, when they train quickly, you'll see them go after the ones that are heavy, but you just need to keep adding data um, and get them more examples um, so it can really start to understand the nature of these. So these are the tools the data scientists are really want to push that down to almost like a data analyst level um, can use to kind of see where the model's at. A lot of times, what I would say more often than not, at this stage, what we're really doing when we look at these confusion matrices is, wonder, is seeing how accurate the labels themselves are, the annotations. It's kind of tricky. Uh, there's, there's different kind of policies almost. Do we label it everywhere we see it, or do we label it in the key location? You know, do we need to split things? Inconsistency among labeling approaches is something that's just kind of natural for this. And I think it probably will be in all sorts of, you know, Hydrogen Torch as well with Label Genie for those that have seen it. Um, you know, if you give it to three different people, most of what I've picked here is probably going to be pretty common, but even that, um, sometimes there's a due date next to a deposit date. And often the deposit date, absent the due date, is the due date, you know, but, but sometimes they're both listed. So what's the strategy about picking those? So I would say it's, it's as common to look at this confusion matrix about thinking of a judgment of where have I put inconsistency into the training data? So the most common thing is to go look at that, at that point is to look at the consistency of it with some specific targets. So you can find your confusion matrix here. You can see what is commonly being classed as something different. So here, customer address, the most common thing is happening is it's not picking it up. Maybe it's leaving a last token or a front token. So that's kind of natural. I don't see any right here. Actually, there here we go. So the due date is actually, that's, that's the other way, same, same sort of thing. So it's kind of struggling a little bit with whether it needs to go in or out. But we'll commonly find classes that two different things are kind of interchangeable. And you'll, so this confusion matrix can help point that out. You go in that with, with that armed with that information going through there and looking to see if we need to clean up our data set. I would say in-house in at H2O, it, it's probably two plus times through a data set to annotate, even on ones where we only do like maybe 50 documents or something like that. So um, trying to give everyone the tools so that they can, they can do that themselves. The actual model training is very simple. The, this is hinting at the UI. I haven't really talked about it too much, but it's pretty simple organization here. We've got different projects. I've got quite a lot in this test uh, environment. But document sets, so I've imported two different document sets, one for my training, one for my testing, which I could have split separately, just happened to do it this way. Um, mostly documents as data, we're, you know, annotation sets, kind of a new term. I don't know that anybody else uses that. But, um, but this is where the documents really become data. We can store lots of different things, our labels, our predictions, our OCR output, um, all the different things that essentially get tacked onto that input data, which we show as images. Um, a lot of times they come in PDF. I haven't talked about that too much, but that's the most common way we get things. So paginating those PDFs, representing them as images on the screen, um, and then attaching all these attributes to them. So we have a lot of different things. And so as you get the hang of your own project, knowing one of these from the other and just managing that data through trying something else, trying maybe a different OCR library, if you didn't like the, the one you tried at first, um, or if you need something different or trying a different model, um, adding data to the model, that's more of the thing, incrementally growing your models over time. I've only got one model here. Those are pretty straightforward. Um, jobs, you can track um, everything that's, that's happening. These are deployed in Kubernetes. 
and that's key for the jobs and the published pipelines. And so I've got GPU instances connected to this. You can do CPUs or GPUs. These are heavy deep learning models. It can take a little while if you do it on CPUs, um, but you can if you want to. Um, the pipelines are the more important thing. So most of what we're doing while we're looking at all this is getting a model ready for end user consumption. Perhaps someone has no idea what a model is. They just give me the answers and I'm gonna work it or I'm gonna review it, whatever that is in the different, different pipelines. Or maybe it's an API that's just gonna go, like we said, checking a different data source and moving things along. So this published pipeline, once I have a model, um, I can create a pipeline and at that point I can lock in my OCR method and these are growing. Our, our dev version has, uh, has seven of these already. So we've got a lot of new stuff coming in our, in our new releases. Pick my model, this is the one that I picked. And then you'll see, I can name it, but um, there's post-processing. So we have a couple different post-processes that are common to what people pick, but you can also add your own. If there's some custom things you wanna do, we've got some Python code that you can add. And then here you get to some of the clusters. The clusters at scoring time is really important. You know, How do you wanna optimize this? So this is Kubernetes en uh, enabled as well, typically on CPUs here, um, but uh, you can use GPUs as well. But we're gonna spread horizontally. So different documents, as we get a queue and fill it up, we're gonna let Kubernetes distribute those on the cluster. So you can size your cluster here, we resize it if you need to, um, but we'll take in a queue of documents, um, we're working on batch loading a bunch as well, but um, you know, distributing those on all the worker nodes, each one accepts a document in, processes that entire pipeline, all the pieces that we just stipulated there of the OCR method, and also the models. And I could have put two models in there, I don't have it, uh, both models, but, um, um, and getting the, the output out in form of a JSON at the end of the day. Um, so, and then it, again, it's really simple. So I can publish this in a couple of minutes. I've actually got one of these. Um, oops, here's my published pipeline. Let me just show you what this looks like. Yes, got one of those just a little bit ago before here. This is kind of what it looks like on the, on the outside. So we have a simple JSON format that we're gonna see what page we're on. We're gonna see a little bit of OCR information. Here's more of what we're looking for. Here's the customer address. Here's our confidence, um, and there's no line ID on this one. Um, and we're going through on what, uh, yeah, so you've got a key value store um, here. So the customer address is the class, the value is the text here. And we just roll through all the predictions this way. So you can manipulate those however you want, and you usually plug it directly in. We have a lot of customers turning that into a simple CSV and can, you know, consuming it that way. But that's our general idea. We're gonna produce one of these JSON objects, again, which you can customize. Um, so there's more options than we see here, but, um, um, and process it, carry it on its way and get it into users' hands. With that, just a little bit over time. So I don't know if we have questions. Perfect, right on time. Um, so uh, if we don't have time for questions, we do have a couple. Um, what's that? All right, I'll take one or two questions, but uh, yeah, feel free to find me after the conference. So this is a really exciting product for us. There's a lot of interest, a lot more than I would have expected maybe three years ago when this was first kind of presented to us. So it's pretty exciting, changing a lot too. Um, so what are the algorithms you're using for Documents AI? Yeah, so um, again, there's two main components. So the computer vision with the OCR, um, we started with Tesseract. For those that have, uh, have tried this yourself, that's a common place to start. Tesseract's a really good CPU-based um, OCR engine, kind of generic OCR. Has a lot of pre-processing built into it, so a lot of people will tweak some settings with Tesseract, um, but reasonably fast compared to some other ones, but um, we usually don't use that. So we usually use something that's built on a DocTR framework, um, so that's uh, an open source model, and that's a pair of models, and now we've got three. So those three models are actually gonna be, we're gonna have a rotation model first, and try to flip the images around, that sends its results um, onto a detection model. We're gonna look at each page of um, each image and look for all the tokens. Tokens to us are space delimited um, tokens, so words essentially, but it doesn't have to be words. Um, so the first model's job is to go find all of the tokens on the page and each of those tokens feed a recognition model. And that's what we would typically, a lot of people typically think of OCR as, is recognizing, but in a whole sea of an image, what, is, what do we need to classify, what do we not? So that, that battery of algorithms um, comes together um, as, as a set, essentially, and we're following the DocTR framework for that, but we've put in our own. So there's a few different backbones um, that are going in there, a few different methods. So we have an efficient net. B3, I think, is one of our leading algorithms at this point. Um, we also have, we put in Paddle OCR, so Paddle Paddle. Um, and it offers a lot of pre-trained different uh, languages. So that's a really powerful library too. So that's the OCR side. 
Then when we have those OCR, that text and the locations of the text feed through the pipeline, and that's where your classification models come in. Whether you're classifying what the page is, like whether this is a, a header page, or it's an image scan, or like a referral, like we would see, just the different parts of a, of a PDF. If you don't know what it is, sight unseen, we're just gonna open up a, a PDF. A lot of customers wanna segregate those into the topic uh, of each one. And so there we're using right now Layout LM primarily, but we're also adding a LILT model, L-I-L-T. Um, that's a pretty new one that came up, I think earlier this year, February or so. Um, and also experimenting with a donut model, and that's even newer um, from July or so. So the, the document AI space is kind of exploding a little bit. And so, um, and with those, uh, but those are the key ones that, that we're using right now. So, um, cut it there? Yeah, okay, all right. So some good questions, yeah, a lot of votes. So I'll try to help out with those uh, if I can. Right, thanks. Yeah, thanks everybody. Oops.